and work up less hard being on holiday and reminding ourselves that it really is the month of Elo. So thank you for being with us. Um, welcome to everybody who is with us. And I am going to sit back, relax and enjoy on the train. So I'm going to turn up my screen. But I thank David and Silver for being with us and looking forward to all of us literally being Zeiche to, um, to real refers, Yeshua's and all that is good. And I know you can see Miriam. I can't see everybody on the screen, but Miriam should have a first shalema. And, um, and everybody should um, be well. So thank you, thank you. And I'm muting myself. Hi, everybody. I see that I didn't sign out of my last class or my last school. So that's what that is. Hello. It's so good to see you all. <laughs> It's good to see all the Brits from overseas. It's good to see everybody. Good to see the Eretz Yisrael Dikas and the Eretz Yisrael Dikas that live in England. Welcome back. It's like Rebbe Sinjav just said, um, it's, it's August, but it's really Elul. So sometimes it's hard to remember that it's Elul because it's August. Sometimes it's very hard to think about August because it's Elul. So let's just give another minute or two for everybody to come on. I know that I have people coming. And I don't want you to miss out on the beginning of the class because I want to tell you a story now that I'm going to share with you. I don't know that I'll share it with anybody else. Maybe. I'll share it with my next class. I have to see if I'm still so inspired. <laughs> Let's let everybody get on. I don't know, do you have in England like the idea that if it's clear, you have to be five minutes late to be, uh... no, you don't have that. They're more right. yekish. In England, we're more yekish, but we try to be. I can't promise you. On time. We try. You're on time. Good. Me too. I like to be a few minutes early, actually. That was something that was put into me by my parents, by my dad. They should rest in peace. I see people are coming on. Let's wait for everybody to come on. Meanwhile, I'll say hi to everybody. Hi, Paula. Hi, Miriam. Hi, Sima Devora. Hi, all the Joannes. We have Joanne Admin. We have Edison Joanne. We have TB. I don't know who's TB. And we have, oh my gosh, Moto E6 Play. <laughs> I don't know that. Hi, Ginny. It's good to see you. Ginny is one of our Eretz Israel because comes on all the shiurim. And hi, Tavora, De... I forgot. Tavora Danzinger, Debbie Danzinger, I forgot. Oh, it's Sippy, that's right. That's better. And hi, Donna and mk and all the phone numbers oh and hi annie it's good to see your name you could put your faces on later when you feel like it and janice thank you for coming and marcel is that you and rebecca and i don't know who else yeah so call a cover that you came you're in the middle of vacation still we're so not on vacation right now in Eretz Israel. Everybody's back to back to. Hi, Pauline, did I say hi to you? Yeah, it's so nice to be back. It's good to take a break, Rebecca, every once in a while, right? Then we come back, we miss each other. We come back, we enjoy each other's company. So I, I must tell you, ladies. Hi, Naomi. I shouldn't get on yet. Let's see. Okay. 
I want to tell you that I am literally on a high right now because I had the opportunity just now to fulfill a mitzvah that I never had, that I never fulfilled in my whole life. And um, when I describe it to you, you're going to think like, whoa, that's, but it was so amazing. So forgive me that I am beginning our, our Tehillim Shir with a, with just a personal um, anecdote, but I can't help it because I couldn't hear my, I couldn't, it was so hard for me to leave. And I said, but I have Hevra, I have, I have London, I have to go to London right now. So of course, they looked at me like I was crazy. You're getting to London right now? I said, yeah, I'm going to London. Manchester, Leeds, and uh, I forgot. Where, Dale, where? I forgot, Jenny, forget it. You're you, Shami, already. I can't remember where you live. Okay, so listen, ladies. In the way where, I, where I'm privileged to teach and where I met you once, all of you. So one of the places I'm privileged to teach, I'm privileged, privileged, privileged to teach in many, many different beautiful places. But um, in the way, we have uh, an organic farm. I don't know if you know this. And when you were here, you probably did not tour it. But Rebson Rebson uh, created a space. She took a space in the, a piece of land that we had, and she created a farm. Don't ask me how she did it. I watched it unfold over the last four years. I don't know how she did it, but whatever it is, I mean, I watched how she did it. I just don't know how she knows how to do these things. She created a farm. We have organic vegetables growing. We have a pond that's growing organic. I don't know what they are, lilies or algae. And then we also have a chicken turkey farm on the way. Now I'm very lucky because my back, right now I am facing my, my, my apartment, the Chasei Hashem with Hashem's revealed kindness to me, faces the way, my mamish back door, back to back. So every morning I hear the Tarnagolim, I hear the, the roosters waking us up and the whole net block hears it. And I love it. I just love it. But you know, roosters and hens produce more roosters and hens and turkeys and turkeyettes, I don't know how you call female turkeys, produce more turkeys. And so we have right now a, a huge amount of um, turkeys and chickens and quails and all kinds of um, kosher birds. And so today, a holy, very holy shochet came and they shechted 15 turkeys and 15 chickens. And I was privileged to be there for the shechita and to say amen to the bracha of the shechita of the shochet and to say amen to the bracha of kisui hadam, the covering of the dam. And then I actually had the opportunity to actually say that bracha myself for the first time in my life and take sand and sprinkle the blood of these shechted birds which are right now, see, I had to leave. I couldn't help them, Kasher, I wanted to help them, but I had to, there was, this is a postponed, we were supposed to do this on Tuesday. Tuesday, I have all the afternoon to be there. The way today, I can't. So I just fulfilled this mitzvah. So now listen, ladies, I am not, um, I'm not a queasy. I don't faint at the sight of blood, but I'm not relishing the sight of blood at all. But I wanted very much to make this bracha, especially in the month of Elul, before Rosh Hashanah. Why not bless Hashem for things that I never was aware of? And I personally was vegan for many, many years. Vegan, then vegetarian. Now I'm not. Now I eat fleshics because my body needs that for my own sturdiness. That's what my uh, health care person says. And I know I feel that way. But, um, so I, I don't have, I'm not like majorly opinionated on this. I'm not avoiding it and I'm not like rushing towards it. I just wanted to make the bracha. I had no idea how this would be. So I, the Shochei came with his sons and 
they're, they're set, they set themselves up and whatever, they did the, they made the bracha, they did the shchitz, and I saw how incredibly careful he was with his knife, that he kept checking it. I saw how as soon as the turkeys got into his hands, they immediately calmed down. And at the very end, somebody said that they actually brought an extra chicken because they did not want to shecht uh, the female chickens because female chickens produce eggs. And that's very, uh, you know, they have a whole system going. And so one of the uh, people who was observing, by the way, no, no students came. They, they were given the option to come, but none of them took us up on it. <laughs> so one of the, they found that they had brought an extra chicken, a female chicken. So one of the people who was observing, just like a, a farmhand said, oh, let's not shech this chicken, let's save it from shechita. And so the shochet said, no, you don't understand. And, and then he, when he said what he said, and I'm about to tell you, then I understood what my experience was. He said, in the neshamas of all animals, we don't understand this is a mystical concept, but somehow the souls of people somehow migrate into some animals. It's probably not comfortable and it's probably not a, not a reward for these souls. But as soon as the animal, a bracha is made and the animal is utilized in a holy way, the souls that are hidden or captured in that animal, the human souls are released and fixed. When he said that, so he said, don't pity this chicken. This chicken wants to be shechted. I just made a bracha. And this, the chicken wants to be shechted. Of course, it's going to be eaten. It's going to be kashered. The salt and the blood, the blood will be removed and it will be eaten. But this chicken wants to be shechted. Don't think that you're saving its life. Rather, recognize that it wants a tikkun. It wants a repair. It wants a soul repair. Now, when the shochet said that, I understood what I had, I had been feeling. I couldn't understand why am I, why am I feeling like I'm at the Kotel? Why am I feeling that it's a very holy experience just observing this? I didn't understand what was going on with me. I was like, I couldn't understand it. Why am I not just calm, but I can't leave. I feel like this is such a special event. And it, I had said the bracha already. I mean, I had said amen. And then later on, I said the bracha. I didn't understand what's keeping me here. And the shochet explained it. He said, because there's something going on now. There are many, many souls. We don't see them. We don't know them. We can't count them. But there are many souls that were stuck in a place of unrepaired, unrectified, and now they're being released and they're overjoyed to have finished their tikkun. So there was a certain level of, um, of, it was a very spiritual experience. You wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought it. Now, the, the, the um, one who arranged this told me that the shochet that she hired is a very holy man. I mean, you could see. And you could see before he began he had kavanot. He was having all these intentions, clearly to release all these souls. And then he began to pray for sick people. And then all of the people observing began to pray. We realized that it's a very, very strong experience that we're having that we very, I personally, I mean, he has it all the time, but I don't have that experience. It wasn't at all gory. It wasn't at all horrible. It was very uplifting. And I just wanted to share that with you. Um, and I'm surprised at my reaction to it. I would have, I was just, I didn't think that I would be uplifted. I thought I was wanting to see, I wanted to make the bracha, say I'm into the bracha. I didn't think it would be uplifting. I thought it'd be interesting to see, but it was an uplifting experience. I felt, ladies, I'm, this is going to sound strange. But I felt like this is a 
preview of the Beis HaMikdash. Because in the Beis HaMikdash, you know, there was a lot of animal sacrifices going on. There was a lot of shechting going on. And it's to us, we think like it's so gross. It's so like we don't relate to it. What is that? But all of us at this, when I was just there, all of us said, you know, this is like kaparot, right? We do, we're going to do kaparot in a couple of weeks, right? Nobody sees the shechita of the kaparot. And of course, it wasn't really actual kaparot now, but everybody had in mind. We all had in mind. Please forgive us, Hashem. Please bless us for a good year. I was davening for it. was davening. It was uplifting. It was, um, it was different. It was a different experience. And I just think that that's how it's going to be in the Beis HaMikdash. Um, it's going to look, on one hand, there's going to be chickens, and there's going to be turkeys, and there's going to be, well, in the Beis HaMikdash, you don't have turkeys. But you're going to have cattle, and you're going to have cows, and you're going to have goats, and you're going to have sheep, and you're going to have... But that's not what you're going to see. And that's not what you're going to perceive. Something else is in store for us. And I was privileged to just experience that. Mom is just now. Mom, I ran in. She kept looking at me, the one who organized it. She said, you're late. You know, you're late. I said, I know. I'm running late. But I, I wanted to share that with you, that there's so much to our Torah that we're not even aware of. And so many experiences that will surprise us. And, you know, maybe you've had your own experiences, I hope positive, with all kinds of, you know, different things that you perhaps not, you know, we're not um, used to seeing and having. But this for me is, was really remarkable. It was remarkable. And again, it was just for me, it was like a base of Niktish experience. So now listen, ladies. The Beis HaMikdash is nothing like, you know, it's not, it's not going to be like this. They're going to be. But the man who was doing the work was a holy man. And his assistants were holy people. And somehow it felt uplifting. That's what's going to be in the Beis HaMikdash. Somehow, I mean, the Beis HaMikdash is not going to need a somehow. It's going to be powerful. So I wanted to share that with you. I don't know if I'll share it later with anybody else. Because I'm still now mamish warm from it. It's cooking in me still. Okay, now we're going to do chapter 24 in Tehillim. Chaf Dalit. Go grab a Tehillim. And the reason we're doing this is because it's part of the, one of the extra Tehillims that we say on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Thank you, Dan. And thank you who said before. I didn't catch who it was before. Thank you to all the people who said thank you. And, and thank you that you're not throwing uh, tomatoes at the screen. Some people wouldn't have liked. I can't explain it. Again, I'm not, I, I really am not pro, pro or anti anything, except, of course, Torah and God. But this was a remarkable experience. And I, and, you know, and everyone felt it, not just me. We were all, you know, all of these experiences. Um, until the Shochet explained that we're sensing the shamas that are releasing from bondage. Halavai by all of us. We should all be released from our bondages, from our bondage, from our Mitzrayim, from our suffering. Each one of us, the whole Jewish people, and eventually the whole world. Amen amen. Okay, let's learn some Tilim. Here's Chavdalit 24. We say this on Rosh Hashanah at night. We say this on Yom Kippur at night, if you're in shul, and it's a big deal. They make a big deal about this parak of Tehillim. And it's a familiar parak because it's a shir shal yom. It's the daily, it's the one that we say for Sunday. And it's short and it's short and sweet. But it's chosen by the Bale, uh, ma, the, the Anshe Knesset HaGadola who puts together the Machser. They said, say this specially on the Yamim Norayim on the special uh, holidays of Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. You know that I, there were so many films I could have chosen today, I could have done with you, the David Hashem. I bet a bunch of you thought I was going to do that because I thought we were saying every single day, twice a day. Or we could say uh, um, what we're going to start to say after Rosh Hashanah, right, right before, right after, right after Yishtabach, we're going to say, uh, 
the Shir Hamalos, Mima Maki, we're going to say that. But I'm going to do this one because this one, I'll tell you why I'm doing this one. You're going to see I'm a little bit selfish when I teach it. Because in shul, for all the years, when they say this, they say it pasuk by pasuk. I don't know if you go to shul at night, Marav, but they say it pasuk by pasuk. Slowly, meditatively. And I never understood why. Like, well, what's the big deal? Okay, you'll see why in a second. But I wanted to enhance. It's also the last thing that they say at night, Marav, it's tiring. So I wanted to enhance my own David. So that's why I picked this. The David Mizmar is a song by David, or to David, a song. So we've learned Mizmar the David. Usually, usually comes Mizmar the David. The, the Zara Kaddish and, and the Gemara have discussion about what the, what this means. If it says Mizmar the David or the David Mizmar, a Mizmar is a song, and Le David means by David. David Melchrode. So the Gemara explains. If it says Mizmor le David, it means first David Amelch was Mizmoring. He was first singing. He was first singing in David. And then le David, then came to David Ruach HaKodesh. Then came to David release and relief and, and um, connection to Hashem. First Mizmor, he first sang. And the Gemara says it, he was in a bad mood, so to speak, or he was having some difficulty, so to speak, but he began davening, davening, and then the release and the, and the answer came. Mizmor first, then Ledavid. Here, Ledavid, first he began with Hashem gave him Ruach HaKodesh. Hashem gave him inspiration. And then Mizmor, he turns it into a parak of Tehillim. And this is a very important teaching that whenever you get inspiration, you need to do something with the inspiration. Don't just sit there and feel good, but do a mitzvah. Even if it's just putting staka, putting aside staka, whatever, saying thank you. Just always take whatever inspiration you have that comes to you, if Hashem is gifting you with inspiration, then use it, um, plug it into something physical ground it into something real. Otherwise, it's going to evaporate. It's not going to make a real Roshim on you. are not going to make a real impression on you. Okay. Lashem ha'aretz umlo'ah tevel v'yoshveva. To Hashem belongs the whole world, everything in it. The tevel is where we live, the inhabited parts. And the people who are in the who are inhabiting the the inhabited parts, okay. That means definitely Melchus saying, Hashem owns the world. Hashem owns the world. Hashem owns everything in the world. Hashem owns the place that we're the apartments that we're living in, and Hashem owns us. It's all Hashem's. It all belongs to God. La Hashem to Hashem le David to David. David Melchus. Thank, so thank you to God by connecting Le David to David and Lashem to Hashem. He wanted to make that bridge, that attachment between him and Hashem. And he says everything belongs to God. Now David Melch was a rich guy. He owned a palace. He owned, you know, he was the king of a country, etc. He says nothing is mine. Le David, Le Lashem, it's all Hashem's. And this is so important, right? It's all everything is Hashem's. Of course, he gives us for self, for, for safe key. He gives us. He's generous to us. But it's all Hashem, every single thing in the room. It's Hashem's. Hashem gave you, you know, on loan from God. Everything. Now, Rashi tells us that, of course, Hashem owns the world. But when it says Ha'aretz, Hashem Ha'aretz, it especially, it, it highlights the word Ares. Ares means Eretz Yisrael. If any of you are B'nai Akiva Nicks, or you went to B'nai Akiva, or you had any kind of like religious Zionist education, they don't call Eretz Yisrael Eretz Yisrael. They call it Ares, like the land, as if there's no other land that exists. That's from this Rashi in this Paraktil. Now listen, he Hashem 
took the land, took the earth, and he somehow planted it on top of the water. So if you want to learn ge geography and geology, scientists are always wondering, like, how does this planet work exactly? Most of the planet is water with earth, with land. How did that happen? And how does the land stay on top of the water? And if you're ever by the beach, you know, if you dig and dig and dig under the sand, you got water. So under the ground is water. And everybody knows if you studied a little bit of geology, you know that really the whole earth has underneath the core, underneath the layer that we see is a core of liquid. There's a core of magnet. There's all kinds of stuff like scientists are, you know, they don't know for sure. You can't drill because it's too hot. Whatever it is, how does this planet work exactly? It's layer on layer on layer. Hashem did it. And David Melch says, Hashem made the ground on the, on the water. He put the Yisod, he foundationed the earth with water, which is liquid. Val it repeated, on rivers, on streams, on water. This whole world is, we're sitting on water right now. So how come we're not falling through the water? How come when you're by the beach, if you dig and you see that there's water underneath the sand, how come that sand doesn't get swallowed up into the water? There's a whole ocean underneath us. That's Hashem. That's what Hashem did. Okay, so now, the first two psukim, this for, these first psukim are just to tell us, to focus us on the high level of God owns everything, God creates everything, God establishes everything. I'm going to share with you a beautiful teaching that, that I was, that one of my students yesterday shared with me. She's not on right now, but I um, have, have a lot of big Sadeka students. And so one of them, I was telling her that, oh, did something just happen? I was telling her a certain meditation that I do. Sometimes I do a meditation where I just, let's say you're having a problem with somebody, you're having an argument with somebody. So you know that that argument only exists in this world. But in the highest world, the world of souls, all of our souls are unified and get along. So if you're having a disagreement or a difficulty with somebody, you can meditate in your mind that you go up to the highest worlds, whatever that, however you do that, and you um, and you think about you and that person. And um, yeah, I'm gonna just take this off. And you um, that work? That didn't work. Anyway. You uh, think about that that person and you are really getting along. You're getting along in a different in a different dimension. So it's very uh, it's very nice to have that thought. So um, yeah. So um, so she said she pointed out to me. She said that's not a meditation. That's a real place. You're going into a real place. And you are where your mind is, as the Baal Shem Tov. So that real place of God owns the world, you can go into that place of God consciousness. That's called Simcha. That's called Hesbodidus. That's called calming down. Just go into a place where you and God are sitting together and you're basking in the presence of the beauty of, the beauty of God's love towards you. Imagine it in your mind. Close your eyes. Go to a place where no one's going to bother you. And just imagine you are going to the place where Hashem's presence is radiating love towards you. And you're just accepting that. That's real. It's not a meditation. It's not an imagination. It's real. Our problem is that we live in the non-real world. We live in the non-real world of difficulties, worries. We live in small-minded. But there's, a set, there's another place that you can go to. Why shouldn't you go to a better place? You can. Imagine you're sitting on the couch and one of your kids is punching you, punching you, punching you. And you're just sitting there. Why would you do that? Just stand up and go to the uh, go to the uh, kitchen. It's a it's a different place. It's the same it's the same 
you can do that. You can go to a different place and there you won't be nudged. Of course, your kid's going to follow you because the kid just wants attention. But the idea is you can go to a place in your mind and that place is just as real as the place in your mind that you are that worries and that's anxious and that's nervous and that's... And now comes, so now that we establish that everything is God's, now David Amalek is going to say to us, you want to go up to God? You want to go to that good place? Here, here's how you go, do it. Mi Hashem. Who is going to be able to go up to the mountain of God? Now, the mountain of God is the base of Mikdash. It's also the idea of a meditation where you perceive Hashem. Who can do that? Who can Ya'aleh? Who can make Aliyah to the Har Hashem, to the mountain of God, to the base of Mikdash, to the base of Mikdash in your mind, to the base of Mikdash that's in Shemaim that's right now, because the base of Mikdash exists right now? Who can go there? Now, this parak of Tilim, you see, all of the phrases are repeating because we're learning Tilim already for a long time. We know that a lot of times when Dabin Amalek wants to, he wants to impress upon our minds something that might be hard, so he'll repeat it with different words. Everybody responds to different visualizations and to different words. So here he's repeating. Who's going to be able to get up, to stand up? Be makom kosho in God's holy place. Same idea. Who can ascend and who can stay and who can then stay there? Who can stand up there? Sometimes, you know, you climb up and then you fall down. Climb up and then you fall down. So who climb up and then stay there? Yaku means to stay there, to stand there. Who can do that? Here's who can do that. Niki kapai. First of all, you have to have clean hands. That means no stealing. Uvar levav, a clean heart. That means try to work on emuna. Try to work on bitachon. Trust in God, faith in God. Try to work on judging people favorably. Try to work on not being jealous. Try to work on, now listen, levav, not bar lev. Levav means... Your both hearts, your good heart, your bad heart. If you have a negative feeling, try to transform it. Say, okay, I have a negative feeling right now. How can I flip it into something positive? So clean hands. Clean heart. That never swore in God's name in vain. Never took God's name in vain. What does that mean? You know, the Ten Commandments, don't, you know, don't take God's name in vain. Don't swear. Don't lie and, and cause God to be your witness to a lie. That's repeated twice. Don't swear falsely. Now look at that. Clean hands, don't, don't steal. Clean heart, try not to be jealous. Try to keep your heart pure and trusting and godly and then twice watch your mouth we know david Melch is very telling us a lot the power of our mouth the power of our mouth the power of our prayers the power of our words it's right now hidden from us it's but i just experienced it because I was just in a place where people were davening in the weirdest way, meaning we're shechting chickens and turkeys, and there's knife and there's blood and there's stuff like that, and everyone's davening their heart out, using words to bring down blessings. Use words. And because you want your words to be effective, then don't tarnish your mouth with lies with mistruths, with trickery. Today is 18th day of Elul. Hi, Elul. Today is the birthday of the Baal Shem Tov, the birthday of the Tanya, the Alter Rebbe. It's also the last 12 days of the year. Each day parallels last year a month. Today parallels last year Tishrei. Tomorrow parallels, last year, Cheshvan. Whatever happens to you today is a fixing for last year's history and an uplifting for it. 
one of the reasons that I said I wanted to go to this uh, shechting party was because of that exact reason. This was supposed to happen. This this whole shechting was supposed to happen this past Tuesday, two days ago. And the shochet had to reschedule. So it happened today, and I was so I was happy that it was today because today is last year's Tishrei. That means we are now experiencing, you're experiencing it through my telling it to you, and I was experiencing it through it happening to me. Uh, uh, an amazing experience of neshamas, of souls being lifted up, of a mitzvah, a rare mitzvah being accomplished, of, a, of an idea of compassion, and an idea of God is in charge of this world. He owns the chickens. He owns the turkeys. He says, yes, you can eat the chickens, but you have to do it the right way. Yes, you can eat the turkeys. You can have to do it the right way. And not just that, but when you do that, somehow you're making a fixing in this world. So that's Tishrei, that's today. See how your last 12 days of the year go. Very powerful. Davin strong. Ad Kedekach, it says, who can go up and make Aliyah to the base? I mean, there's people who keep their mouths. Try your best. Listen, we're all human. We're not angels. Try, just try a little. We, we have to try a little bit more to make our speech more constructive and more constructive. Constructive vis-a-vis -vis God and constructive vis-a-vis -vis people accomplishing something. I just saw such a nice story that uh, on Yom Kippur, you know, Yom Kippur, a lot of people don't talk. Some people do a time to see, but on Yom Kippur, they don't talk. Um, because Yom Kippur is such a powerful day, they want that every single syllable that comes out of their mouth should be prayer. So they won't stam, stam talk. That, that's some people's customs. I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying that I'm advising that. I'm just going to tell you a story about that. So on Yom Kippur one year, the Chavetz Chaim was there was a, a man in his yeshiva in Raden in uh, Russia, wherever Raden was, Poland. This was a hundred years ago, and this was a man who was in his fifties who had never gotten married. And so after davening on Yom Kippur night. You know, in my shul, Yom Kippur, the men sleep in shul. They put mattresses down and they sleep there all night in shul. And they, you know, they're learning, they're davening, they're just, they're just being with camaraderie in a holy place, in a holy way. So, um, so the Chavetz Chaim went over to this man who had never gotten married and he started schmoozing with him. Stop talking about nothingness, not about holy things, but about, you know, where were you this week? Where were you Rosh Hashanah? What was the davening like for you? Where are you going to be in Sukkot? Uh, you know, how's work? I, whatever. He was talking to him some for hours. And all of the people who were in the shul were shocked, like the Chavetz Chaim of all people is talking on your Kippur of all people. Thank you, Lithuania. So, um, thank you, Miriam. So, um, Afterwards, that man who had never gotten married was just telling people, he says, you know, I always feel my loneliness, but Shabbos and Yantif, people invite me over, I sit with families, and I feel better. I'm with people, I feel better. Because there's meals, there's sudas, and everybody, you know, people invite me. But Yom Kippur is a Yantif, but there's no suda. And I was beginning to feel lonely, and the Chavetz Chaim, it was so geschmack. Rebbe came and talked to me for hours. I didn't feel lonely. And then people, this man was, I guess, a simple, perhaps a little bit of simple. And, and the people understood. That's why the Chavetz Chaim was talking to him. Because he understood that words could be so powerful. And you don't even have to be saying anything. If you see someone's lonely and you call them up and you say, tell me, you know, you have a very good recipe for, for potato kugel. And of course, everybody has a, their own secret recipe for potato kugel. And the person might be uh, complimented that you're asking them. You don't have to be talking about Rashi and Tosfus and the Gemara. You can be talking about what color do you think I should paint the bathroom? And if that person feels that they're necessary and that you're helping, that you're, they're helping you, you just done, you've just done a gigantic myth. So that's how you come to the Harashem. That's how you come to the mountain of God, is, is you use your power of speech in a holy way. Okay, now this person, who has clean hands, a clean heart, a clean mouth, is going to receive blessings from God. Yisabracham Hashem, going to receive 
the, he, the word Yisal literally means he will be lifted up with blessings from God. With Saka, and he'll be re receive kindness. Saka from Hashem. Man, okay, you show a very simple word. So you're wondering, what does this have to do with Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur? I think you see that Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur is about getting back to basics of goodness, goodness of heart, goodness, reality. Not you don't have to be, you don't have to be um, such a bikia in every single one of the slichos and all of the different piyutim and all of the different. Uh, uh, liturgical poems that we say. Nowadays, we sing them in shul. In the olden days, they used to say them. You don't have to be so bulky in that. You just have to be a pure heart, pure hands. Zen Dor Dor Shav, this is for us, girls, ladies. Whenever I read this pasuk, I always say, this is us. And I don't know, maybe a hundred years ago, they said, that they said that this was them. I say, this is us. This is a generation that we are seeking God. Zen Dor, this is a generation of Dor Shav. We're seeking him. We are looking for God. We're looking for him. We're searching for your face, Hashem. Sel Yaakov. Yaakov means the Jewish people. That means us. Sela, a, a, a apostrophe. I mean, an exclamation point. We're telling you, Hashem, that we're searching for you. We're such an empty generation. This world is so absolutely, absurdly crazy. Such craziness going on on the planet now. So many, so much confusion, so much untruth, so much darkness. And we're looking, we're searching, where is Hashem? It's true that it's a beautiful world. And if you look hard, you can see God. But if you also look, you can see a lot of suffering and a lot of confusion, a lot of, a lot of darkness. And we're looking, we're searching for you, Hashem. We're searching for you. Now listen, the re this, is the, this is this middle of the parak. The beginning of the parak, everything is God. The middle of the parak is, what do I have to do to come to you, Hashem? I have to be good, I have to be better. I once asked the Stalin Arabia a question, and he said, all of us can improve our ways. It was a very simple answer, and it's so profound that I wrote it down in my sitter. Every one of us can, can just do a little bit better. Now comes the very famous story of how the Beis HaMikdash opened its doors. So the final part of this parak is entering into the Beis HaMikdash and Mashiach. Okay? Now, we sing this song. We start, we start it on Mariv. We, start, we say this pack of Tilim, Mariv of Rosh Hashanah night, the first night and the second night, Mariv of Yom Kippur. But we're going to see that it this, these psukim accompany us until sukkahs, till the very last hakafa. This is the first, this, what I'm going to read to you now, what we're going to learn now, the psukim, these words, is the last thing we sing on, on Simchas Torah. Su, I'm not going to sing it for you. Su'u Sha'ar Rashechem. Gates, the Sharim, the gates of the Beit Hamikdash, or the gates of heaven, or the gates of Geula, or the gates of my heart and my mind. All of those are included in these words, Sharim, the gates. Gates, he's talking to the gates. David Melch is now talking to the gates. And he says, Gates, pick up your heads. Vihinasu pitche olam. Pitre Olam is the same thing as Sharim, the petach of the world, the opening of the world. Pick yourselves up. Ve'evo melech hakamot, so God could enter. Suush, so now David Amelch made up these words. They were sung many years after his death at the opening of the Beis HaMikdash, the opening ceremony when Shlomo Melch opened up the Beis HaMikdash. They sang this parak of Tzillin. And they sang these words. You know why? Because the gates of the Hechel were closed. Somehow, after they built the Beis HaMikdash, and they began, they wanted to inaugurate it. All of a sudden, those fancy gates that he built slammed shut, and they couldn't budge them open. David Amelch in, in Nevoah saw that. He wrote this pasuk in, in Nevoah, in prophecy. 
And he says, gates, open up so that Hashem's presence can come in. This is what we sing when we put the Sefer Torah away in, uh, in the Heichal, on, on Simcha Sor, right? And they make, the first time I ever saw this, I fell in love with it. And I haven't stopped being in love with it since. Because what do they do in Shul? They, you know, they, they're supposed to, the Gabbai and the Rabbi are singing, saying we have to, we have to lay now. And we have to have Musaf because the Hakafas have to be over, right? Hakafas, if you're going to a shul that looks at the clock and it tries to do Musaf before, you know, while the time, while, in the right time. So they want to, you have to now, after Hakafas on Simchasar morning, you have to now read the whole, read the Sefer, you have to read the Torah. Everybody has to get an Aliyah. And then you have to put the Sefer Torah away. And then you have to have a Musaf. So, the singing and the, sing, the going around the, the going around the bima with the with the sefer Torah, it has to have a certain time limit. If you want to get to Musaf on time, so everybody's screaming like, "Okay, we got a le- right there's the last hakafa," and always the people in shul who don't want to listen because they're so in love with the Torah, they they bring the Torah up to the Aron Kodesh and then they then they go backwards. They bring it as if to put it away, and then they say, "No, I'm not putting it away." And they again, they dance in the safe, they, they dance the safe Torah into the heichal, into the Aaron Kodesh, and then they turn around and they dance around the shul again, as if to say, "We don't want to stop holding the safe Torah. We don't want to stop singing with it. We don't want to stop dancing with the safe Torah." And that's how, and that's how they put the safe Torah. Eventually, of course, they do put it away, but only after making a dance. That the, in the dance itself, singing this song, they sing this song, and the, and the dance that they sing is, we don't want to let go of this dance, and we don't want to let go of this song. Okay, and they repeat it, the, the Pasuk repeats it in different words. We're going to see the difference in a second. So first, the gates should open up so we could, Hashem's glory should come in. And it's as if the gates are saying, Miza Mal who is this, who's Hashem? And we answer, Hashem Izuz the Gibor. Hashem is the, what do you mean? Hashem is the source of battle, battle and strength. Uh, strength. Hashem Gibor Milchama. Hashem is the one who makes all the wars in the world. Hashem is the one who makes all the, everything in the world. And the Sukkim are, are repeated. Su'ushar Meshechem. Okay, now you know who Hashem is. Open up the gates. Usu'u Pitchei Olam. And let the opening of the world Open. A little bit different terminology. V'yavo melech ha-kavos, Hashem should come in. And then the gates say again, Mi uze melech ha-kavos? Who is Hashem? Hashem tzvakot, hu melech ha-kavos el. Hashem, the Hashem of the, of the, of the tzva shemaim, of the heavens, that's Hashem. So what did the Mepharshim tell us here? There's two levels of God's re- revelation in this world. When the first time David Melch says, gates open, open up your gates, right? And he's talking to the base of Mikdash. He's talking to the heart, gates of our heart. He's talking to the gates of heaven, the gates that will somehow le- allow Hashem's light to come through. And the first time he talks about it, it's before Mashiach comes. And therefore, there's going to be a lot of war. There's going to be a lot of battles. There's Yetzirah's, there's conflict, there's difficulty, there's um, opposition. That's why Hashem is called Hashem Gibor Milchama. In the beginning of the revelation of God, there's going to be perhaps, there's going to be a little bit of opposition. When Mashiach comes in the very beginning, you think it's going to be all smooth sailing? I don't know. So therefore, Hashem has to manifest himself as Gibor Milchama. Hashem is going to have to fight for us. But then, when Mashiach is finally here and established, then it doesn't say that the gates should pick themselves up, but the gates, the Pitchei Olam, the opening of the world, is going to be lifted up by Hashem. It's not going to need any external, it's going to be done already. And there Hashem is no longer Gibor Milchama, 
no more wars. Rather, Melech HaKavod. Hashem is only the Hashem is Fakot, only Hashem. We don't need battles. We're not going to need conflicts. We're not going to need every, every, everyone will know Hashem. So the Medjish tells us, as you know, the, I'm sorry, the Gemara in Shabbos tells us a very famous story that Shlomo HaMelech knew about this Perak of Tilim, and he knew that his father had composed this Perak of Tilim to be said at the opening of the Beis HaMikdash. And so when the gates shut, they, when they wouldn't open, so Shlomo HaMelech knew that he had to say this Perak of Tilim. So he did. And he expected that the gates would open. And they didn't. And he said it again, and they didn't. And so then Shlomo HaMelech said, Ba'avur David Avdecha, al tashev p'nei mishichecha. In the merit of David HaMelech, Shlomo HaMelech said another pasuk that was not in this parak of Tehillim. He said, please Hashem, for the sake of David, don't turn away your Mashiach, which he meant himself, he meant Shlomo, he meant himself. For the sake of David HaMelech, please open up the base of Mikdash. And then the gates sprung wide open. The Gemara and Shabbos tells us why did it happened like this. David HaMelech, David HaMelech uh, wrote this parak of Tehillim, it was supposed to work. And without mentioning his name. So, the Gemara says that David HaMelech said to Hashem, please Hashem, show me that you forgave me for the sin of Bathsheba. And Hashem said, I forgive you. I'll tell you right off the bat. I forgive you. You're forgiven. And so David HaMelech said, but show me in public. Let everybody see. Because it'll be a Kiddush Hashem if everybody sees that I didn't do the wrong thing. And that even whatever little thing I did wrong, I did shuva for, and shuva helps. So show me. Do it, display that you forgave me publicly. So Hashem says like this, I'm going to hold off showing that for a more powerful time. Because if I show people now, whatever, someone, some Navi, a prophet comes and says, Hashem forgave you, that's one thing, but I want it to be more public, publicized. So David HaMelech, after he, he passed away, and then Shlomo HaMelech built the base of Mikdash with the instructions of David HaMelech. And at the base of Mikdash, he said this parak of Tehillim in the Zuchus of David HaMelech to open it up, and it wouldn't open until Shlomo understood, maybe this is the time where Hashem is going to publicly forgive my father and show that tshuva works. And that's when he said, Ba'avur David Abdecha, for the sake of David, your servant. And that's when the gates opened. And that's when David's sin was, or mistake, was publicly shown to be mechupar, atoned for. And that was the whole purpose of the Beis HaMikdash, the purpose of the Beis HaMikdash. And now the purpose of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur is all to show us that tshuva helps and that Masim Tovim help, and that Davening helps. And David Amelch wanted it to be shown to him in his lifetime. And Hashem said, I'm going to wait until it's more effective. So right now we ask Hashem also, please show me that you're doing, I'm doing a good job. Give me a good, give me a good pat on the back publicly. Hashem says, sometimes I will. Sometimes I will. But sometimes I'll wait until it's more effective. So now we finish Chavdalet, and we just touched the surface of it. Now I want you to say Chavdalet on your own, and hopefully Be'ezrat Hashem, when, when Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur comes, and we'll, the second part of the last Pesukim is all about begging God for Mashiach. Now you know why we say it on Sunday. It's the Shir Shalyom for Sunday, because Sunday is the first day of the week that Mashiach can come, really mostly Shabbos. And we say at Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur because we're pleading for Mashiach to come. We're not just pleading for a good year, a good upcoming year. We should have that also. But we're pleading for Hashem to already make the whole purpose of creation happen. That the Geula should happen. God's name should be sanctified. The name of the Jewish people who keep Torah mitzvahs should be glorified and magnified. We're prepared to teach. We are prepared to teach everybody. We need 
truth. We can't have darkness anymore. It's too hard. So that's what we have before Rosh Hashanah. Yom Kippur, Mashiach should come and the Sha'arim should open. The gates of light should open for us. That's Rosh Hashanah. Anyway, thanks for coming back to our Tehillim Thursdays. Thank you, Rebbe Sindel, for arranging this and for your administrators for all taking care of all the different logistics of everything. Thank you, Rebbe Sindel, for being with me, escorting me. so much. So nice to be back. Train. Oh, you're on the and train to Manchester, right? I arrived in London. The sun is shining. The light is here. And it should always just continue. But you have literally carried me through. So I thank you very much for that. And thank it's, you from everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to listen to a Shia when you're on the train. Are you in London or you're in Manchester? I left London and I've now arrived in Manchester. I'm in a taxi in Manchester on the way to the seed office for the first um, in-person Wiser Women class. Um, wow. in but people can join us on Zoom. We'll start at around 11.15. But it's also seven. And we're here also for a simcha. We're here for a simcha for a bar mitzvah, the Shabbos, and then back to London, the Ezra Sashem. So. Mazel tov, mazel tov. Only simchas. Go from simcha to simcha. Oh, man. Shabbos, everybody. Good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.